how can you use ChatGPT for your own business without risking your client's privacy? In this episode, we sit down with Federico Comero, CTO and Head of AI in IntelliWay. We are going to chat about the potentials of generative AI and how we can make it safe for business. So keep listening and learn how to build a safe, powerful and private version of ChatGPT for your own company. Welcome to the AI and Digital Transformation podcast brought to you by GMSC Consulting. Today, we're here with Frederico Comero, and he's the CTO of IntelliWay. And today, we're going to talk about a use case that they worked on in the company on a question and answer database. So somehow like a chat GPT sort of thing, but private usage. So welcome, Frederico, to our podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Angelique. Thank you, Gabriele. So before we start uh, discussing further about this interesting use case, could do you kindly describe, like, uh, talk more about yourself in a few sentences, like what, how was your journey to becoming a CTO of IntelliWay and like, yeah, everything we need to know about okay. Frederico. Of <laughs> How did you end up uh, a short CEO of uh, the yeah, company? <laughs> well, I'm Frederico Comerio, one of the founders of Intelway. As I said, it's a Brazilian company focused on cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. So today I hold the position of the CTO and also the head of the AI of this company. I started in the IT business very early, at the age of 16 years old, thanks to Beto, my older cousin, who already worked on this area and as a microcomputer technician since early 90s. And I started as an intern position at the company he used to work for when I was 16. And at the age of 20, I really entered in the world of software developer because I was hired I was hired by a software factory company here in Brazil called Inflor, and and it it happens alongside with my college. I'm I just finished in 2000 early of 2000 uh, computer science degree, and after working like four years in this company, I joined one of the, the biggest cybersecurity companies here in Brazil. And there I specialized myself in project management. Like I got the PNP certification, Prince 2 certification, Scrum Master certification. I worked mainly as a technical leader and a project manager there and worked there for about 10 years and from 2017 on i decided to undertake together with some colleagues who worked with me at this company and we started create a company more focused on innovation and from this point forward i basically focus all my energies completely on AI and AI application to the business. So I think since my childhood, I was passionate by technology and never, I was never in doubt what, which career I would like to, to follow. And I really think that artificial intelligence is a very powerful and excellent approach to achieve this objective of transform the world through technology. That's my, my short history, not so short, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a long journey, but yeah, I think we're just getting started with it. <laughs> All interesting <laughs> journeys are long kind of. <laughs> yeah. My white hair and white bird <laughs> doesn't let me, <laughs> doesn't let me lie about the, this long journey. 
uh, to go a bit deeper into today's use case, um, you, as you said, uh, you had the opportunity to work with uh, industry, and uh, this one is also a big industry, very renowned in industry. And um, I would, I think it would be interesting to start from where did the need for uh, AI tools to uh, manage their knowledge base uh, started from? Like, uh, how do you um, start a process where you, uh, together with the company, decide, oh, maybe we need these tools, and uh, and how do you somehow evaluate the business value of applying AI to these tools. As long as you grow and you scale your business, it becomes more expensive to maintain some, some business process with human labor. Because historically, if we try to figure out what's happening of the costs of the human labor, and the cost of technology, we see uh, human labor growing it, it costs and from the other side, technology is reducing its costs. We may think about 10 years ago, how expensive it was to each megabyte on the cloud and, and processing and cloud computer in general. So the region between this uh, expensive labor and the ship uh, technology uh, is that this area of the graph is how uh, you can uh, be more eff effective as a company when you try to scale your business process with AI. If it's okay with you, could you maybe uh, give us a couple of examples of how AI, generative AI was used in that case, I mean, how did generative AI help the customer? And uh, and then maybe uh, what's the difference compared to the previous tools you had that were still based on NLP, but not generative AI? Before AI, uh, we probably needed, the, the company probably need to use uh, people to attend most of the support and and other related tasks that the AI layer nowadays solve. And we have a, a estimative that about 4,000 uh, uh, tickets are created and 80% of them are solved by the AI layer. So it's a very expressive, uh, expressive uh, key point. And the second uh, era of this business process it was using classical NLP to modeling their solution. Uh, it used basically statistics to try to understand the, the, the user intents. And uh, when, when we run this way, I would say like 50-50 of it was the it was the radio we we got like fifty percent of the attendees were solved at the AI layer. The other fifty percent well we have to to transport to the the human labor. But so you 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 mean that like uh, tickets for customer assistance, for example, even internal or external? Yeah, it involves customers, uh, suppliers, and um, workers, um, employees, yeah. Yeah, so something like maybe a supplier comes in and says, sends a, um, I creates a ticket with, I'd like to know when my payment will be due and That's using an LP, you understand that it's asking about the payment, yeah. identify the entities related to uh, the name of the supplier and uh, the name of the invoice is referring to the code and then after this NLP part, there is the classic IT infrastructure that just goes into the database and fetches the information. Once we, we are talking specifically about conversational AI projects, I would I like to 
uh, think that conversational AI, it's a kind of translator. Uh, so it basically translates natural language to queries or API requests. And that's why you n mostly need, uh, when you level up the game, you, you need to have uh, software development skills, not only AI skills to integrate systems internally. And when you are luck, you you got the, an API well documented. When many cases you have a legacy system, for example, you don't have an API, so you need to create an API for them. You need to access the database somehow, or in the worst scenario, you need to use um, RPA uh, robots macros to simulate a real user interacting with the legacy system and performing the tasks. There are basically the three methods you can you can face when you try to integrate AI to the legacy systems. Did you also use uh, this system um, for uh, document uh, retri retrieval? Retrieval. Retrieval. Sorry. Yeah. It's like chat with your documents, <laughs> but we but we are we are talking not on a single document, but uh, but a thousand six hundred documents compiled. So you have uh, lots of uh, new challenges when you face with a long long uh, chain of documents. Sometimes you need to create an ag agent in the top of the communication, for example. So let's split those documents in small domains because we know that as much we specialize in AI, more eff effective is the AI. So sometimes you have to have an agent layer before the, the generative AI just to capture the subject and then route it to, to, to the correct neural network, the correct pre-trained system you want to answer. So many times, as I say, uh, generative AI is not a silver bullet for everything. Um, if you know uh, other AI approaches, other AI disciplines, you can have uh, lots of layers, different layers that use different technologies and that's why a, a company uh, which expert specializes on AI consultancy is useful because you got your pain, pain, and we know a lot of tools on the toolbox. Like, oh, let's uh, strip this problem and split it in in different uh, small pro problems. So to achieve the outcome we need. We have first to use, for example, uh, OCR for this part. Then we add uh, classical NLP to classify, and then we use generative AI to get the results from the NLP that will translate it to the generative AI, giving you a better prompt for your generative AI. Because I always say the power of generative AI is, is the prompt because Generative AI in conversational uh, applications is basically a text generator. So as much as your input, which is your prompt, is more specific and more rich, better will be the result. So we use the strategies to have other AI's uh, uh, technologies before to translate it to, to a better prompt to get better results. Absolutely. So I'll try to add a clarification layer, maybe for our less techy listeners. And um, um, just what we, have, what many of us as have learned to appreciate is the ChatGPT online or other Bard or other systems equivalent, or you just ask a questions and in return you have an answer. But when these systems are used, like in the case of IntelliWay solutions inside a company for automatizing some kind of business process, uh, usually there is um, what a prompt, meaning like there is a template for the question that is being asked to the, to the system. And uh, right now it's kind of hard to build up the proper uh, template, 
But important thing in the template has to be filled with the proper information uh, to extract, to get the, these models to answer properly. And to fill in this information happens what uh, uh, Frederico was telling. So sometimes some information may come from an OCR, like some optical character recognition, so like printed text uh, to digital text. Uh, sometimes it comes from classic NLP, like in the examples from before, for example, maybe it's the name of the supplier that has to be filled in a specific position inside the prompt. And, um, and one of the latest achievements of the system is that all of these activities are also orchestrated by a, a large language model, usually, that, that works as an agent that decides what to feed, what and when to feed something to the OCR, what and when to use one of these classification or entity recognition uh, algorithm and puts everything together and then files the final question with the uh, proper language model, maybe the ones that have been specifically trained, for example, uh, to reply about the API, the proprietary API of the vendor you're using, or maybe to answer like customer query, which is probably a, a different model. So there is the, all of this infrastructure behind mm -hmm. and that's... It's like a hood. It's like we're trying to open up the hood in this episode because like from what I gather, since I'm not really an expert, whenever people talk to me about chat GPT and Bard, it's like saying there's this genie, genie in the bottle and then it will just answer your questions. While in this case, I can picture more of it like there's a small librarian in your hood that's trying to get all the information, compiling everything, trying to understand your prompt and then gathering all the documents you need for that certain prompt. It's like I like to say it's a building block process. Yeah. Yeah. And each block is specialized on a very small task, but small, but it's uh, it's important to the process uh, at all. And for example, sometimes we need to get information direct from a database. So maybe you need to use generative AI to or other kind of AI to convert the the, the question to a, a, a SQL query um, and it's just one of the dozen of examples we have to face when we really try to make AI to be effective on a business context and especially on big companies that you have a very rich ecosystem and complex uh, yeah. uh, links between them yeah well I don't know if you, you have a follow-up yeah, question. I, I don't know if this ever happened to you, uh, to your company, Federico, but actually one of the applications in big and old companies of uh, generative AI is also to kind of uh, translate all documents, all database into a new format because one of the things this model are really good are like converting one format into another format. And uh, so sometimes, uh, uh, because sometimes big companies are locked in using old software that has, that manages old files, old templates. And, uh, uh, and before these tools uh, accessing these documents was very uh, time consuming from a developer point of view, because they would have to study the format and somehow write the conversion tools. And uh, now another thing that generative AI can do indeed is to bridge this gap. Uh, maybe it's not accurate 99%, like 100% of the times, uh, but you still get 90, 90% of the job done at 1% of the effort. So it's uh, it's still worth the trade-off for, uh, for many. I don't know, did that happen to you, uh, Federico? Yeah, no, I, I understand, I see most of the data that is useful for AI projects, unfortunately, is unstructured. So almost most of the generated data is unstructured. Often knowledge of data engineering, data science, and big data is combined with the knowledge of AI to be able to train the models and so on. Because as I said, data is the fool, but 
you cannot use the data as is most of the times. Fortunately, it's becoming every day less complex to deal with unstructured data, precisely because of the AI algorithms are increasingly uh, facilitating the process of deal with unstructured data, such as documents, scans, videos, audios, media files are very, very rich in terms of information that we need to use AI to transform this data, to use this transformed data to train on other AI uh, layers. And that's, we come back to the, the concept of the building blocks. But many cases, this conversion can still be a challenge, especially when you don't have enough data engineering and big data skills to build a, a, an adequate pipeline uh, that can automate this this process because the data is still going to be generated as is the the source will will not change you have to adapt your project to deal with this source limitations and transformation and automated what we call a zero touch solution that people don't have to do manual activities to the, the, the let the flow <laughs> rise of the the data pipeline automatically not impacting the the people who produce the data yeah so from what i gathered what of what you said like data is important and which made me wonder like in big companies i'm pretty sure many of them are aware about how important data is that they might probably have a data science or data engineering team but for the case of small and medium inter enterprises or businesses i don't think that's always the case in in teleway do you provide like a support for these businesses or do you Tell them, look, you have to get a data science team or else it's not going to work because the models won't be that accurate if you don't have a good team in your own company. Well, um, usually when we implement, deploy a project or even when a company is using one of the IntelliWay projects, they also uh, buy the support or maintenance or consulting uh, contracts because it's very hard to keep a, a PND uh, team if technology or AI is not your main business. So uh, not only AI, but the technology area in general and historically has daily updates that you need to follow. So as a technology company we always try to maintain a, a research and development sector to follow this innovation this disruptions to test a lot of things and this is a kind of money that you that you you see burning inside the company but it makes you have a, a difference in the market so and we often take advantage of the maturity of new technology in our products. I feel like in case of generative AI, it's a good example that we were ahead of the hype. So we started using generative AI in our products and some projects uh, before the chat DPT hype. But certainly this is a challenge for any technology company. And if we... Um, reflect this on the companies that are not don't have technology as their main uh, purpose they will have a big chance to fail if they need want to do it by themselves the most important thing in my opinion is to understand that technology is good it, no technology is the silver bullet because as we discussed before, we still use uh, old AI approach like classic NLP for some problems, for example, um, uh, in detriment of generative AI. The most important thing, in my opinion, is to know as much as 
tools and and, and technologies in your toolbox and understand in which cases each one applies better than others in what use cases uh, they perform better in terms of cost benefit so it's the the big the big jump uh, when you when you hire a consultant specialized specialized on ai instead of trying to absorb other thinking house the chances of success of relying this decision of a specialized company is always be much greater than you try to study and try to follow everything by yourself if it's not your business area great so an interesting chat what do you say we move <laughs> to the final question yeah so to wrap it up i would like to ask you if you have any recommended book that you could uh, share with us and with our listeners it doesn't have to be on ai but yeah yeah um, my favorite book ever is sapiens from yuri harari but if we talk about uh, how technology itself and of course ai cannot be a part of that is going to change the human being and, and the our species i would like to recommend another book from Hahari, which is Homo God or Homo Deus. I don't know how, how Homo Deus, it's yeah, translated. It's like yeah. The second volume, I think. Yeah. It's by this yeah. Israeli, uh, I can't remember. He's a writer, but I can, he's a thinker and yeah. yeah, he wrote these two books. Could be a good read. Yeah. So this is my yeah. piece of advice. I know. It, it will open our minds through the what is, can be possible to come. Thanks for sharing the suggestion with us today. <laughs> and uh, thank you for being here with us and discussing these topics. And uh, for whoever would like to uh, work with IntelliWay, uh, you will find in the episode description the, uh, all the links uh, that you need. Yeah. So thank you again for having been here with us during this episode. And Hope you're here from us next time. Yes. Bye. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you, Gabriele. Bye-bye.